I'm not trying to say a definite mid-tribulation rapture, but what I am definitely trying to say is this. And hear me clear, everybody, and you on the camera. If we think that just because we're Americans, see, that's the problem I really have. I'm all about pre-tribulation. Hallelujah. Get us out of here, Lord. At the same time, if we think for one second because we're Americans that everything's just going to go the way we want it to go until we float away happily in the sky and that we may never have to experience trial and tribulation upon American soil, then I think that we're being foolish and I think that our preachers are preaching a gospel to us that ain't going to work all over the world. Amen. That's all I'm trying to say. I hope that doesn't upset your night, but nevertheless, that is what I'm trying to say. All right, now we're going to move on. So here we are. Let's go to uh, Revelation chapter 8. It says, and I'm going to just start reading in Revelation 8. And I don't know how far we'll get tonight, but let's see here. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. And, you know, the idea here is, is that some serious judgment is about to fall upon the earth and that heaven has become completely silent. The, seventh, the opening of the seventh seal essentially allows the blowing of the first trumpet. It doesn't really say a whole lot about the seventh seal other than it's connected to this silence that takes place in heaven. It's almost like there's awe in heaven about what's about to happen. It says, I saw the seven angels which stood before God and to them were given seven trumpets. Now, I have to tell you that I got very caught up, even though I was supposed to be looking more specifically at these trumpets, what kept hitting me time and again were Old Testament passages that in some way seemed to connect themselves to these scriptures that were taking place. And so just hold the thought about seven trumpets. We'll get there in a second. But then in verse three, it says, and another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar that was before the throne. So what we see is a picture of a censer. That's what this is right here. I mean, I'm not saying that it looked like that in the ancient days, but this is a more modern version of a censer. If you've ever been in a Catholic church at a funeral or some services, they'll, they have the, the coal in there already. and They'll throw some incense on there and they start and it kind of fills up the whole room with the smoke. So that's what a censer does. It, 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 it has a live coal in it and incense. It's kind of like a portable golden altar, if you will. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a second. But I want you to see the connection between, it says, about the prayers of the saints. So the incense, along with the prayers of the saints, are coming up in, in, into the presence of God, if you will. Now, ultimately, i got to tell you, this censer is going to be thrown on the earth. One of the, there's going to be an angel that's going to take this censer and he's going, to, he's going to chunk it on the earth. And once this happens, the first angel is going to blow a trumpet. But I want you to get a picture of what you see intercession with the censer. As a matter of fact, if, you, if we would go, we're not going to go there because we don't have time to read the passages. But I'm going to kind of tell you the story a little bit. Out of Leviticus chapter 10 and also Numbers chapter 16. And I put under there first the plan and then the person. Because in both of these situations, what I'm trying to explain to you is that judgment in Revelation is about to hit the earth. Amen. And it's all because mankind for thousands of years of human history has rejected this right here. Both the plan and the person. Because mankind refused to accept God's plan and his person and instead chose to live in the midst of sin and, and refused to receive the sacrifice of the lamb. Ultimately, judgment is going to come upon the earth. In Leviticus chapter 10 is the story of Aaron's two sons, Abihu and Nadab. Have you ever heard that story before? The Aaron's sons were the ones that from their lineage and their bloodline were to be the high priest. You remember the story of what a high priest would do, right? He was the only one that could go beyond the veil once a year and he would offer blood on the mercy seat. And so and in this situation, it says that Abihu and Nadab took both of them censers. Now, some people I've read in commentary say that it was the golden altar, but the scripture says real clearly that they both took a golden censer. So each one of them had one in their hand, one of these things kind of like this. And it says that they offered up strange fire. Now, now this is the thing. Fire for the censer was only supposed to come from one place. 
Can you imagine where? Like there was di different kinds of fires maybe taking place within the tabernacle camp. But the fire to ignite the incense, which was going to, in this revelation passage, allow incense to be in the presence of God. The fire, only fire that was supposed to ignite that incense was a coal or fire that came specifically from the brazen altar. Why do you think that? Anybody know anything about the brazen altar? Anybody want to shout that out there right there? Quick, quick word, no? The cross. Amen? The brazen altar is all about the sacrifice. Amen? And because it was on the altar, the brazen altar, that the sacrifice was offered up before the Lord. And there was always fire from the sacrifice, the coals that were there. And, and so they would take those coals and they would put them in the golden censer and then they would put the incense on there. But Abihu and Nadab, they chose to get fire from another source. Listen, Christian, you can't get to God any other way than keeping your faith in the finished work of Christ. God's plan has always been the same. Hold on to Jesus. Hold on to his sacrifice no matter what you're going through amen hold on to him hold on to the lamb and God's grace is going to flow in you and it's going to and it's going to move in you and it's going to give you the victory that you're looking for don't let go amen they chose to go another way and they were destroyed by fire so that was the plan they rejected the plan number two in number 16 they it was it had to do with the purpose the person the person was rejected well, what you talking about well in number 16 there was a man named Coral. And he lifted himself up and he took 250 of the Israelites with him. And this is what he said. He, 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 he stood up in the face of Moses. And he said, why are you alone the only one that can lead the children? We're all, but he didn't say the word anointed, but that was his idea. We're all the anointed of God. So he's coming against the person. And what ended up happening was, was that Moses said, I'll tell you what, all 250 y'all, y'all get some censers and y'all start burning y'all's incense. Because only certain people were allowed to burn incense. Mm -hmm. And we're going to ask the Lord to show us who is the sanctified ones, meaning separated out ones that were supposed to burn incense. Mm -hmm. So they were coming against the mediator of the old covenant. <laughs> the word of God says in the book of Hebrews that Jesus is, is a mediator of a better covenant. Amen. Because he's the fulfillment of the type that Moses was. Because the new covenant fulfills the old covenant. But what I want you to see is this. Is that what happens is, is that Moses goes to the Lord. And then, and, then he, and then the voice comes forth and says, why should all of these people be destroyed for the sin of one man? So Korah and I just got the thought of Adam and his sin and how it spread through the entirety of the human race. And here's Moses interceding in the midst of this scenario for God's people and saying, no, God, don't kill them all. Just kill the one that caused the problem. And so in Romans 5 says, because of the one offense of one man, sin spread through the entirety of the human race. But the free gift of God, hallelujah, which was Jesus, gives victory or gives freedom to each and every one of us. It pays the penalty for the sin that we received from our father Adam. But what ended up happening was the earth opened up and swallowed up the ones that stayed with Korah. And it's the same thing that's going to happen. The mankind that refuses to come to God is going to find himself in the midst of a pit, an abyss, Gehenna, the lake of fire, yeah. the second death. And so what I wanted you to see, though, is that, is that the censor also... It, this has to do, I put a little, that little circular thing right there. So you can see that that was the golden altar. And the, and the sensor was a portable device connected to the golden altar where the once a year when the high priest would go in, he would bring that sensor with him. And that sensor would have smoke and it would shield him from the presence of a holy God. Yeah. And so what this sensor represents and what this smoke represents, along with the prayers of the saints, all being in the presence of God. It represents intercession. It represents God holding his hand back and not allowing judgment to take place on mankind. And specifically in this passage of scripture, we hear the concept of, of the prayers of the saints being connected to this particular situation. Now, though, this censor, it, well, let's just go ahead and read it in, in, in um, chapter 8. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. So what I'm trying to say is this. 
is that all these thousands of years of human history, God created a nation. To that nation, he gave all these types and shadows that represented Jesus. Jesus ultimately is our intercession. He's the only thing that can stand between us and the wrath of God. But for all these thousands of years, mankind has rejected both the plan and the purpose of God. And this smoke that would come up that always stayed the hand of God. Now in this censer, all of the prayers of the saints, all of the is, is, is literally thrown onto the earth. And now that very thing that restrained that restrain judgment is now about to initiate judgment upon the earth in a way like never before. Now, one of the other things that I noticed was is that seven trumpets. You remember we preached a while back on the, on the walls of Jericho. Remember that? How for six days, once a day, the children of Israel walked around one time and every time they would, they, they, that they did it, nothing happened. And that six was the number of man, right? But number seven is the number of God, amen, the fulfillment of God, the completion of God. And on the seventh day, they blew seven trumpets and the walls came down. Now, the interesting thing about Jericho, if you'll remember when I taught it was, was that it was the first stronghold that the children of Israel entered into when they crossed Jordan to go into the promised land. God had promised them a promise, amen, that they would have a promised land. But whenever they crossed the Jordan, the first thing that they're facing is this huge stronghold that stands in the way. God says, you're not going to go through it. you got to, you got to go around it. you got to trust me in the midst of it. I'm going to bring it down. And when I do, now you're going to be able to enter into your promises. Well, one of the things that I started noticing is that, or at least I feel like it's sound, is that there's been a stronghold upon this earth since the garden narrative. Amen. Since the day that the serpent slithered into the garden and he caused Adam and Eve to fall and go again in rebellion against God, there's been a stronghold of sin upon this earth. The earth has been cursed by the fall of man. All creation, according to Romans 8, groans awaiting for the redemption of the sons of men. Talking about you and I, that we would finally not just be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That's already happened. Hallelujah. But I'm talking about redeemed, taken from this earth and receiving our glorified body and things that are wrong in us being made right. All creation groans for that day because itself also knows. The earth knows. It groans that, that it has something better awaiting it. A new heavens and a new earth. Amen. And so, but what, I, but I, what I'm trying to tell you is, is that all of this time that sin has been a stronghold in this earth. Seven trumpets, just like the seven trumpets of Jericho. At Jericho, the stronghold fell. The stronghold of sin is about to fall upon this earth. And God, listen, this is what's interesting. Uh, whenever the seventh angel sounds, you know, we probably, we're not going to get there tonight, I can assure you. The seventh angel sounds, chapter 11, verse 15. It says, and the seventh angel sounded, Revelation 11, verse 15. The seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdom of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. So essentially when the seventh trumpet is blown, voices say that now the kingdom is literally and physically, it, it doesn't happen yet, but it's voice that it's happening. See, one of the things that I've talked to you about a lot uh, is that there's actually two kingdoms that coexist on the earth. You, you know that, right? That's not hard to figure out. There's the kingdom of darkness and there's the kingdom of light. Jesus brought the light into the midst of darkness. And it's a spiritual kingdom. It's a spiritual concept. You're either being ruled by one kingdom or you're being ruled by another kingdom. Amen. And if you're being, if you've given your heart to the Lord and you understand how to have victory in Christ, then the Holy Spirit can rule and reign in your life and give you victory, amen, to where you don't have to be a slave of the other kingdom. That's all taking place spiritually right now. But the fact of the matter is, is that there's coming a day when Jesus is going to physically rule and reign upon this earth, amen, and the trumpet of number seven, the voice goes forth and says, now. Now it's, now it's here. It's coming. The, the kingdom of these, uh, how did I say it again? The seventh angel sounded, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. How many times have I quoted to you Psalm chapter 2? How many times have we quoted those passages of scripture that talk about the heathen and the kings of the earth coming against God, coming against God's plan, amen? And, 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 that, and that all, and Revelation 17 saying that these kings come against God and his plan, but there's coming a day, hallelujah, 
And when that seventh trumpet is sounded, then it's going to tell us that the kingdom of God is now is going to be given, amen, to the rightful heir to whom it always belongs. So I want you to see that God is doing this in a very methodical way. He's allowing the wrath to fall upon this earth and is breaking down the stronghold of sin that's been on this earth for thousands of years. And when it's all said and done, Jesus is going to rule and reign upon the earth. Amen. All right. And so it says right here, we're still we're still going. So we talked about the Jericho thing. Uh, one of the things that I did want to point out connecting it to the kingdom is in Matthew chapter six. I don't have to really turn there and read it. But in Matthew chapter six, verse nine, the Lord teaches us how to pray. Remember that? And, and unfortunately, some churches think that you're supposed to pray it exactly like that. It's really a form of a prayer. But one of the things he says is our father who art in heaven. So we're supposed to pray to the father. And Jesus taught us to pray to the father through his name. Amen. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed, sanctified, separated, holy is your name. There is no other God, hallelujah, above you. He's altogether alone. Amen. He's altogether separated. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, it ain't here yet. You understand that? Jesus said, pray to the Father this way. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yes, the kingdom is here in the sense that Jesus came, hallelujah, and in a spiritual sense, like I just explained, you and I enter in through faith, but Jesus isn't literally here yet, and so until he shows up, everything is still in disarray, everything is still in the midst of chaos, it's not the way that God intended it to be. I just want to, I just want to oppose to you this concept too, because we got a censer, and we have incense, and we have the prayers of the saints. And I don't know about you, but whenever I was reading this passage of Scripture, that's the first thing I thought about when I looked at trumpet number seven, that the kingdom is actually given to the right king, right? Or at least it's announced that it's going to happen. And then it's talking about the prayers of the saints. And the prayers of the saints and all that intercession that stayed the hand of God are thrown upon the earth. And I just started thinking, how many of us, and I'm talking to the preacher, pray the way the Lord taught us to pray in the sense that, your kingdom come. Your will be done. I mean, do we not realize the tragedy that takes place upon this earth? And many times we're so caught up in our own circumstances. Come on. We're all guilty of that. So caught up in our own circumstances and our own trials and tribulations that we forget that there's trial and tribulation going on in the heavenly realm. And the Lord told us to pray, your kingdom come. Your will be done. Amen. And all the prayers of these saints, true saints of God, I believe, have been praying that way. Amen. For thousands of years. And all those prayers and that censor and all that incense has been coming up before the Lord. Now it has been cast to the earth and the first trumpet is about to blow. And so we've got seven trumpets. We already talked a little bit about that. And we talked about Jericho. That's just a picture of them walking around Jericho. I got ahead of myself. Here's trumpet number one. Let's go to Revelation chapter 8. <laughs> Revelation chapter 8 verse 7. Trumpet number one. Now one of the other things that was interesting to me, and I kind of just wrote it in here, like in this first trumpet sound, it's going to affect the trees and the grass. Specifically in creation, that was on the third day. So the trumpet numbers aren't lining up with creation days. But what's interesting to me is, is that these very things that are going to be affected were the things that God originally created. The, heaven, the earth is his and the fullness thereof. Amen. And I told you all that last week, but I saw it even a little bit more clearly whenever I got into this passage of scripture. That God is going to judge the earth that he created and gave for Adam to oversee. And then when Adam fell to the way of the serpent, he actually, Adam relinquished his dominion over to the enemy and caused a fall to take place on the earth. God's going to judge this earth and through the judgment he places on this earth is going to judge these unrepentant human beings that refuse to go the way of the plan and the person, amen, which is Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the gospel. That's what Paul said. We preach Christ crucified. And so it says in this first, in this, uh, in verse seven, the first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth 
and the third part of trees was burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Now, you can only imagine how another Old Testament passage that I thought of with this was, I think I might have a, a picture. Can you, I mean, when I, I, I look for that picture, I just Google, you know, first trumpet. And so I, I see this picture here, and I see all this, I think of fire and brimstone, you know? And I, and I started thinking about Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and, and the fact that what we're talking about here is judgment. And the fact that judgment hit over there. And that when it was all said and done, remember, it was like, it was like a, it's called a Christophany. When you see Jesus show up in the Old Testament. And it was Jesus and two angels showed up in the Old Testament, met with Abraham, and told them what they were about to do to Sodom and Gomorrah. And started questioning, well, and Abraham starts interceding for him. But, but would you would you not do it for 50? It's been a while since I've read the story, so just forgive me. But would you not save it for 50? Would you not? And he works his way all the way down, and the only people that are left really is Lot. And to be honest with you, Lot's not really that righteous, but he's a believer in this in the right God. Amen. And, and it's because of they were unrepentant. Sodom and Gomorrah was unrepentant and refused to go the ways of God and judgment hit them. And in a similar fashion, that's what this first trumpet does is that it allows fire and blood, uh, fire, hail and fire mingled with blood cast upon the earth. And a third part of the trees were burned up and a third part of the grass was burned up. Now, can you imagine the devastation and the effect that that would have? I mean, whenever grass is burned up, the trees are burned up. Then, you know, that, that's cattle can't graze in those areas. Famine begins to strike, right? And so that's trumpet number one. And it's just a picture of things burning. Okay, let's go to trumpet number two. Revelation chapter 8, verses 8 and 9. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. Now, you know... What could it mean physically of a great mountain? I don't know about you, but, but I think that there's the possibility that it could be a huge meteor. Now, the next, the next trumpet that sounds is actually, it tells us that a star falls from the sky. But, you know, what could, it, could it be just a bigger meteor? I don't really know exactly. It doesn't tell us. It just tells us a burning mountain falls from the sky. And, and, and that what ends up happening is, is that it was cast into the sea. And that a third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. Now, on the fifth day, God created the creatures in the sea. All right. And so you see now on this trumpet th that these things are being destroyed. Now, in order for the I would think in order for the ships to be destroyed in this in this fashion, that this mountain or this huge meteor or whatever it is comes into the ocean and probably causes a huge tsunami is what I'm thinking, right? Mm -hmm. uh, somebody said recently that there was supposed to be a meteor that's supposed to hit in September somewhere near Puerto Rico. Uh, but, you know, I read, I listened to the original prophecy and the guy never gave a date. But there's literally people that have believed that and, have, you know, have taken off. So all I'm trying to tell you is, is that certainly though a meteor hitting in the ocean would cause a tsunami and would overturn ships. Now, the interesting thing about the blood part, um, it goes on to say this. Let's just talk about that for a second, about the blood part. Well, first, before we get there, I was thinking about a burning mountain out of Exodus 24. <laughs> Moses goes up on the mountain, and the Word of God says that, that the glory of the Lord was like a fire on the mountain. All right, And it's while he's on this mountain that he receives the Ten Commandments. So we see the picture of a burning mountain, and we also see a burning mountain that now falls into the ocean. So all I'm trying to make a connection is, once again, we see a picture of judgment. God gave his word to mankind. Mankind refused to follow God's word, broke God's law. Now a mountain that had the glory of God burning upon it where the law of God was given. Now we see a burning mountain falling into the ocean. Okay, that was the only point I wanted to make there. And so we see the picture of a burning mountain. But look at this. This is the BP oil spill. I put this in my book whenever I was, because I, I remembered it. Like, I didn't even, I didn't read this somewhere. I remember seeing pictures of it whenever I was, whenever the BP oil spill was going on. I can remember thinking, man, that looks like blood. And, and there were some places in the marsh grass where it looked like congealed blood. One of the points that I'm making by bringing this up is, is that I still want you to see 
the levels of deception that could be layered on top of one another. You understand what I'm getting at? I mean, you could also say some type of a missile could be saying that it's a star falling from the sky. I got some pictures of that, but I don't think we're going to get into it right now. We'll, we'll save that for the next trumpet. But mankind can still try to mimic these things. Mm -hmm. In other words, what I'm getting at is, is that I think when this happens, this is the wrath of God happening. These are stars that God is allowing to fall from the sky. If anything, meteors that are falling from the sky. At the same time, I'm telling you, mankind technologically could theoretically try to mimic some of these things. Yeah. And you have layers of deception upon layers of deception to where you think something's going on when in reality it's not. Now, now you, you do what you uh, think what you want about this. but in, uh, So in Revelation 8, I'm sorry, yeah, in, in Revelation 8, verse 11, I'm, I'm going to hurry up with this and then we'll stop. It says the name of the star, it says in verse 10, I'm sorry, the third angel sounded, there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Now, so there's a couple of things I want to tell you about. Now, Rand, I don't know if you remember this or not, but I was on vacation and you texted me. You're like, dude, the river in China is turning blood. I'm like, oh, come on, man. It's here. You know, and you're right, you know, I was like, let me get I Googled it. That was it right there. This right here, this is the Yangtze River in China. And they, and they didn't know what would happen. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, the river turned blood red for, I don't remember how many days it was. They still don't know exactly what happened as far as I know. So I'm tr what I'm trying to say is, is that weird things can happen, and I would not be surprised if mankind can't mimic some things and make some things happen. But check this out. This is where it gets really weird. Wormwood. That word right there, Chernobyl, how many people are old enough to remember that? Mm -hmm. You? Mm -hmm. All you youngsters, y'all don't remember that. But over there in Russia, they had a nuclear plant, and all of a sudden, that thing blew up. Mm -hmm. And the, whole, the top of that thing weighed over a million pounds. And it just started spewing this nuclear radiation waste in the sky. And I'm talking about, I saw some pictures as I was researching this, babies with tumors like five feet long on their back. It was horrible. Yeah. Uh, and that word Chernobyl in Russian means wormwood. Is that not the weirdest thing? Wow. I mean, if I had time, and we'll do it someday, I could show you connections with that whole 9-11 thing that'll blow your mind away. Things that were done so far in advance that it's almost like it seems like they put something was planned like 50 years in advance. Could that be? I don't know. You do what you want. But all I'm trying to say is, is how weird is that? That the name of this place, Chernobyl, means wormwood. And that this. So what, one other thought process of a mimicking type deal or whatever the case could theoretically be some type of a bomb nuclear waste into the ocean. You know, even that earthquake that hit Japan, they say it's still leaking radiation into the Pacific Ocean. Nobody talks about it, but that's what they say. And so here's that uh, Chernobyl spewing that radiation stuff in there. You see it almost looks like uh, over there East New Orleans when you drive by everything after Katrina. And that was, I just, I just was thinking about a star coming from the sky that's supposed to be a picture of a missile, an intercontinental ballistic missile. And just thinking about how it looks kind of like a star. You know what I'm saying? Coming out of the sky. I'm not saying that that's what it is. I'm just trying to throw some things out there. And that if it exploded in waterways, the right waterway, and sent all that toxic waste in there, that it would, you know, could theoretically be a uh, wormwood type thing. Now, I put these cards in here because, once again, I, and I'm about to close with this. I put these cards in here. This is called the Illuminati card game. And if you, read, if you read my book, you're familiar with it. This blew me away. I'm just telling you right now. When I did this research and I found this out, I'm telling you right now. I was like, wow, this is, this is something. So this card here doesn't really solidify too much. Because if you're, if you're old enough to remember the Alaskan Valdez oil spill, it was on a tanker. And as a matter of fact, if you look in the background, it looks like this is a tanker back here that's sinking. So theoretically, and I don't remember when that Alaskan oil spill was, but it was a long time ago. So this by itself doesn't really solidify the picture for me. But this right here, you, you see what that is on the left there, right? That's the World Trade Center mm -hmm. and then the Pentagon. This card game was patented in 1995. Now, I'm telling you, I, I cross-referenced this for days before I ever put it in my book. 
This is called the Illuminati card game, and this thing was patented in 1995, and it's got a picture of the World Trade Center, and it's got a picture of the Pentagon uh, uh, on fire, and both of those things were hit on 9-11. Now, is that the strangest thing you ever saw in your life? And if I'm not mistaken, in one of these things, it's been a while, you probably can't see it, but if I'm not mistaken, that's a pyramid right there, which is kind of like, but I mean, it's the Illuminati card game, so you wouldn't be, yeah. you wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> so what I'm trying, the only reason that I put all this in here is just to make the point that the truth of the matter is, is that there's, there's ways that the enemy through mankind and even the system of the Antichrist could bring deception and layer deception upon deception to the point that we think one thing's going on and the reality of it is it's not even that. You understand what I'm getting at? We need the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen.